to visit Johannesburg Law Faculty and the Department of Trade and Industry, specifically Companies Tribunal and CIPC. And um, I want to really thank them for the opportunity. And I hope that this is the first of many more collaborative events and um, projects between us and the Department of Trade and Industry. So I also want to welcome all the students, all the UJ students, all my UJ colleagues, colleagues and students from other faculties, uh, members of the public as well as practitioners, and especially uh, members of the Department of Trade and Industry um, and colleagues of the Department of uh, Trade and Industry. I really appreciate you taking the time and the effort to be with us this afternoon. And um, I really hope you're going to also enjoy hey, this presentation. No, I if I can just ask everyone to um, mute your microphones, um, please. Then also just a few um, house rules. We're going to give each presenter um, 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes to do their presentation. Please make use of the chat function if you do have any questions, and we will then deal with the questions um, after the last presentation. So I want to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Clement Marumuache. He is a member of the Companies Tribunal, and he's also an Associate Professor of the University of the Witwatersrand, Front, our neighbor. He is a practicing attorney specializing in pension law and family law. Clement also lectures pension law at postgraduate level. He also lectures insolvency law and procedural law courses at undergraduate le level. And he is a former counselor of the Legal Practice Council. So he's currently an academic member of the Judicial Service Commission. Clement is also passionate about the development of candidate legal practitioners and conducts research that is aimed at eradicating artificial barriers meant to restrict the entry of legal to the pre, uh, legal profession. So Prof. Clement is also a member of the advisory committee of the South African Law Reform Commission project, uh, which is mandated to investigate the possibility of introducing a single marriage statute in South Africa. And I do think the Dean and Prof. Clement will have a lot to discuss um, afterwards, as I know that she is also interested and um, this is also one project that is uh, near to her heart. So Ms. Lucinda Stienkamp from CIPC is also a very good friend, long-standing colleague, and she obtained her LLB at the University of the Free State in 2004, and she is an admitted attorney. She practiced as an attorney until 2009, also um, specializing in criminal family and corporate law. She then joined uh, CIPC, and in 2017, she accepted the appointment of senior legal advisor within the corporate legal division at CIPC. So as a legal advisor, his responsibilities includes the Companies Act, as well as other legislation, interpretation and management, as well as liaising with other regulators, law enforcement agencies, and uh, CIPC uh, pertaining to CIPC matters. And she's also the CIPC Deputy Information Officer. Um, recently, the new Beneficial Ownership Register was brought um, online by CRPC, and this also falls under the corporate legal umbrella. So we are in very good company, and I really want to thank our two speakers for taking time to share their experience with us today. So um, I hand over to Pro Clement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Khalid. And thank you very much to all the colleagues who came through and come to, to listen to, to this talk. Um, it is always a pleasure uh, being invited to come and share one's experiences. I mean, um, one, I'm not as experienced in as far as company law con uh, is concerned, and I will never claim to be an expert in, in company law. Uh, but having had been given an opportunity to be part of the company's tribunal, um, I realize that there is certain aspects of South African company law which are neglected, which you will not hear a great deal of when one peruse various company law textbooks and scholarly books generally. And you will find that the role and the work of the, of the tribunal and its importance um, is never accorded as much attention as one would love it to be. While there are people who have written there and there about it, 
it doesn't seem like it has become a priority, especially from the academic uh, circles. And it doesn't appear as if the decisions that we are writing, our, our colleagues in various universities are actually engaging with them, either to write case notes or certain other writings in respect there. And I think part of the reason I agreed to do this is to invoke that interest, to say there is certain aspects of company law which really needs attention. And perhaps maybe those who are enthusiastic and enthusiastic about company law, they will actually um, receive the call and follow up and start paying attention to the work that we do at the tribunal. In this lecture, I will be discussing certain aspects that relate to the South African Companies Tribunal. It will not be possible for me to cover the whole range of spectrum of it in about 20 minutes. But in particular, I'll be reflecting on its mandate, its jurisdiction, the nature of the tribunal, the character, and the functions uh, that this tribunal has to carry out. And of course, I will look at some of the, the nature of the disputes that the tribunal usually deals with. And you'll realize that the tribunal's jurisdiction is very much limited. There are certain things that we can do. And you find that most of the disputes that arise in the context of the Companies Act we are not actually, or we do not actually have jurisdiction to, to entertain those. But those that we, we can, we are able to, to try to, to contribute. I will also reflect on the options that are available to those who are not satisfied with the decisions of the tribunal as to what steps they can take and where they can actually go. And if time permits, I will try to do some juxtaposition in relation to other areas of law to see how the tribunal is situated and whether the way in which the high court in particular has treated the tribunal, um, it is in line with the convention in as far as some of the cases that are taken to the high court, either on review or on, a, on appeal, um, are concerned to, to reflect as to whether the way looks like in any. which currently things are done, which things are done, they ought to be done. Now, I just want us to look at uh, so who's moving the, the slides, or am I able to? Anyway, this you know, is an entity that was established in terms of Section 1. It is an independent entity that is subject only to the constitution and law. Companies exercise its functions in accordance with the Companies Act. In terms of the trust and not than 10 other members of the Minister of Trade and Industry. It is only up to the constitution and the law. Because the tribunal must be suitably qualified and have economics, law, commerce, industry, or public affairs. And the chairman. Some tribunals serve for a term of five years, but they can also come and be appointed for about for for for, for the different term. Now, I want to 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 we we know how this tribunal has actually been built. Now, I want us to look at the functions of this tribunal. And section one point five of the company's. It grants the tribunal I'm sorry, Prof. Um, can we interrupt you quickly?
Colleagues, I will try and get the proof uh, back online. Uh, can you all hear me? Um, yes, yes we Prof, can. we can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Prof, maybe switch off your camera. Maybe that will assist us with the sound. Our audio is... All right. Can you hear me now? It's better. Thank you very much. All right. No, no, I, I apologize for that. But I, I just outlined the, the, the establishment of the, or how the tribunal was actually established. It is it's established in terms of, of legislation, the Companies Act. But I just want us now to look at some of the functions um, of the tribunal. In terms of Section 195, uh, the tribunal adjudicates disputes. And I was about to say that these are disputes that are prescribed in the act. Uh, the tribunal does not dis uh, adjudicate over all the disputes that arises in the context of the, of the company's act. And we'll go later on in some of the, the disputes that the company's, act, the, the company's tribunal can actually adjudicate. But apart from the adjudication function, it can also conduct alternative dispute resolution such as mediation, conciliation, and arbitration. And the tribunal now, it has taken a, a conscious decision to say we need to go out to various stakeholders to make them aware that we have the capacity and we have the necessary skills to be able to conduct uh, these different ADR methods. And we want to encourage all the stakeholders to be able to utilize um, the tribunal in respect uh, to these ADR methods. But apart from that, the tribunal also has the power to perform any other function assigned to it, or in terms of the Companies Act, or any other uh, law that is mentioned in Schedule 4 um, of, the, of the Act. And we find that one of those, those laws that are, that are mentioned there, it is a Trademarks Act. So if there is anything in respect of a company that, is, that, that impacts any of those laws, then the tribunal will have jurisdiction to deal with that matter. Now, in terms of Section 182 of the Companies Act, when adjudicating a hearing, the tribunal may direct or summon any person to appear at any specified time or place. It may question any person under oath or affirmation. It may summon or order any person to produce any book, document, or item necessary for the purposes of the hearing. And it may give directions prohibiting or restricting the publication of any evidence given by the tribunal. So now, this seems to, 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 to point that somehow the tribunal always have hearings that are akin or similar to actual proceedings when one looks at the, the civil courts and how they operate. By and large, the, the functions or the way in which the tribunal works, it works in more like a motion proceedings, wherein people submit whatever evidence that they have in terms of evidence. So even though the tribunal can do these kinds of functions, um, in practice, we, don't, we, we do not see a lot of this happening. What we see is parties who are approaching the tribunal, submitting their, um, their affidavits, and their matters being dealt with in terms of those affidavits. Of course, when the matter is opposed, then the parties will be granted an opportunity to come and argue their matters. They will be given a specific time to argue their matters, and once the arguments have been presented, then a decision or a statement with reasons will actually be provided. Now, in terms of Section 180 of the Companies Act, the tribunal is mandated to conduct its adjudication proceedings expeditiously and in accordance with the principles of national justice. At the conclusion of the adjudication proceedings, the presiding member must issue a decision together with written reasons for the decision. And we try by all means to, in each and every matter that we are dealing with, to make sure that we do provide um, an order and the order will be supported uh, by, by reasons. And this is where perhaps one would, would think that academics would be interested in the things that we are writing. Because when we, when we get feedback from academics, it will really assist us to see whether we are on the right track or we are missing the mark or how we can approach certain aspects of what we are doing. So it is really important that those who are specializing in, in company law engage with our work with a view to ride on it 
and of course point out things that perhaps maybe we might not be doing as well as we should. So at the end of every dispute that we are dealing with, when we are adjudicating, we will provide a decision um, with, 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 with reasons. The tribunal may determine any matter of procedure uh, for an adjudication of a hearing with due regard to the circumstances of the case. So now you'll find that in order to make sure that the matter runs smoothly, the member may be able to, to provide some guidelines as to how the matter will, 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 will proceed. But you'll find that there are rules that have been established that we try to, to follow from time to time to ensure that matters are able to, to, to be disposed of expeditiously. I now want us to, to look at the, at the jurisdiction of the tribunal. The tribunal has jurisdiction throughout the country. In other words, it can deal with a dispute that it has the power to deal with, irrespective of where that dispute arises in the country. However, it does not have jurisdiction to adjudicate all company-related disputes. The legislature directly accorded the tribunal jurisdiction to deal only with specific disputes through selected provisions of the Companies Act, which require complainants to make an application to the tribunal when a prescribed dispute arises. And I want us to look at those. The first one, and the most common one, most of the work that we do, we deal with um, the name disputes, where people are complaining about uh, the, the one will be saying, look, um, this name is my name, and uh, the other one uh, came later with it, and please, can you please um, order the, the commissioner to, 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 to get rid of this name so that this person does not compete with me or does not violate my trademark uh, as it were. So the issue of names um, or the disputes relating to names, they constitute most of the disputes that, we, that we're dealing with. In terms of Section 160, read with Sections 11, 12, and 14 of the Companies Act, Disputes concerning reservation or registration of names can be referred to the tribunal. And once these disputes have been referred to the tribunal, the member who's allocated or the panel that has been allocated, they must apply their mind to, to these particular disputes with a view to make sure that they, at the end of the day, they provide a, a decision with reasons. Most of the matters are unopposed and they're disposed of on the papers that we receive. But we find that there's still much to be done as far as how these cases should be brought uh, to, the, to the company's tribunal. And I think uh, the, the, the tribunal itself, it, it has to engage more with stakeholders to say, look, this is how you actually uh, lodge a complaint, or this is how you bring an application before the tribunal. So that, because sometimes you find that in most instances, um, a lot of lawyer, uh, lawyers will be providing a lot of paper, sometimes which is not necessarily uh, relevant to what we are dealing with. So you find that there are still uh, some gaps in relation to how this uh, particular dispute must be referred to the tribunal. Now, in terms of Section 17 of the Companies Act, disputes relating to the alteration, translations, and consolidations of memorandum of incorporation can be referred to the tribunal. So the tribunal does have jurisdiction where there are issues relating to the alterations and translations and all those things in respect of memorandum of, of incorporation. I mean, ever since I've been there, I've, I, I, I've recently joined the tribunal. I've never seen this kind of dispute, but this is one of the disputes that we, we, we have jurisdiction to, to adjudicate. In terms of section 61, subsection seven, the Companies Act can actually be approached to extend or to provide an extension to a company uh, to, convey, to convene its annual general meeting. Because sometimes you might find that for one reason or the other, the company might not be able to convene the, the AGM at the time when it is supposed to do so. So if that time has come and the company was unable to do so, to hold that meeting, they can actually uh, approach the tribunal to be granted an extension uh, to convene that particular meeting. Now, in terms of Section 71, Section 8 of the Companies Act, the tribunal can adjudicate disputes relating to the removal of directors uh, in companies that have fewer than three directors. So you find that all these small companies, where the directors are no longer seeing eye to eye, and one or two directors, or one of the directors uh, wants to get rid of the other, they can actually approach the tribunal and, and make out a case why that particular uh, director should actually be removed uh, from their office. So these are and we also see these 
um, in, in, in large volumes where directors not see eye to eye and we have to, to intervene. The tribunal can also exempt companies from appointing social and ethics committees in terms of Section 72 of the Companies Act. Now, when you look at the Companies Act, there are certain categories of companies that are required as a matter of legislation to have social and ethics committees. And you find that at times these companies are unable to, 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 to establish these committees and they will have to come to the tribunal and, and, and provide some justifications to why they cannot, they should be exempted uh, from complying with this requirement. Now, the, the tribunal can also review and set aside notices issued by the CIPC, the commission, related to the appointment of company secretaries, auditors, assessment, uh, of course, uh, by, the, by the commission in terms of section 84, subsection 7 of the Companies Act. And, and you find that this is really extensive powers that the, the, the tribunal has. So if the, there's a company that has been assessed by the commission and that company is not happy with, with how the assessment uh, was done in relation to its appointment, that company can actually approach the tribunal to, to intervene. In terms of section 172, the tribunal can review compliance notices because sometimes you find that the commission also issues these compliance notices. And if the companies are happy with that compliance notice, then they can actually come to us to, 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 to intervene and make out a case as to why we should actually intervene. The tribunal also has jurisdiction to conduct alternative dispute resolution. I've already uh, referred to this one, and this is in terms of section 166. And I think this is an area that we really want to tap into because we, we find that most of the disputes can really be, be mediated to be quite honest. I mean, when one looks at arbitration, sometimes it, it is a little bit difficult to, to understand the real distinction between adjudication and arbitration because of the adversarial nature. But when one brings mediation into, into the point and negotiation and conciliation, then you start seeing things changing a, a little bit. So we are trying to get more into the system to say, look, we are available with these kinds of, of services and we want stakeholders to be able to utilize us in relation to, to these services. Now, I want us to look at how then one makes an application or one applies to, to the tribunal. Now, the procedure for referring disputes to a tribunal are set out in the company's regulation, uh, company's regulations uh, of 2011. Now, there are many regulations that are, that are really important, but I think the most important one for the purpose of this lecture, uh, it is regulation 142. And in terms of this regulation, when referring a dispute to a tribunal, an applicant must complete an application form, which is a relevant form. We call it CTR 142. This application form must be accompanied by a supporting affidavit that sets out the facts on which the application is based. So it is important that someone does not just merely approach the tribunal. The person must approach the tribunal, but there must be facts that support the allegation that that person has raised uh, in relation to the dispute that, uh, that, that has been referred to, to the tribunal. Now, once the application has been served on the, on the person um, who the applicant is actually in dispute with, then that person will have about 20 business days to file an, oppos uh, an opposing paper if he has any. So uh, an answering affidavit or an opposing affidavit, wherein this person will also set out uh, relevant facts which will support his or her defense or its defense in relation to the claim that has been brought before the, the commission. And there is also uh, um, an opportunity for the person who brought the dispute to also be able to serve uh, a replying affidavit if there is a need. But in practice, what, uh, what happens most is that a lot of companies, they come to a tribunal and you find that those that they are actually complaining about or uh, raise disputes with respect to those companies do not defend or oppose uh, the applications brought. And you find that these cases are always dealt with um, on, on, on default basis. So we, we, we grant a lot of default sort of uh, decisions in respect of these matters. But it doesn't mean that it is free for all or it is granted by mere asking for it. Still, even though the person is coming and there's been no opposition, they still have to make out a case as to why they should be granted the order that they are seeking. And you find that uh, we also dismiss a lot of ex parte applications with, or ap applications where uh, 
the other party failed to oppose the, the application. So you find that even though there's no opposition, the application itself, uh, the merit has been done or the merits of the application uh, do not uh, uh, warrant that we grant a, spe a specific order. Now, assuming that everything is in order, that the, the, all the parties have brought their affidavits and the, the Secretariat has collected all the, the papers, then the matter will be set down for, for argument and the parties will be, will be allowed an opportunity um, to, to argue their cases and they will be allowed time to argue their cases. And once they have argued their cases, then we'll be able to deliver a judgment or what we call a decision on the matter. And of course, um, in, in respect of applications that are brought on default basis, then we don't have a hearing. We just disposed of the matter based on the papers before the adjudication. So now, generally, that's how the, 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 the tribunal actually works. But I thought it was important over and above uh, the, the issues related to the role of the, of the, of the, of the tribunal to try to make this lecture a little bit academic to some extent, so that we can interest even um, those who are practicing in this area. Now, what I've seen ever since I've joined the, the, the tribunal is that there are great areas of research for, for colleagues who are researching in this area of, 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 of law. And the students as well, there is a great deal uh, that students can actually tap into in as far as their research reports, dissertations, this is our concern. When one looks at the, the first, the, the first issue of interest is the, the jurisdiction of the, of the tribunal. The question that comes to mind is there are other sort of administrative bodies out there which perform quasi-judicial sort of duties, and we'll get to that point if time, time permits. And you find that these bodies are not as restricted in relation to the matters that they actually deal with. Like, for instance, if you take the, the pension funds adjudicator, uh, you can see that the, the pension funds adjudicator can, can adjudicate over all aspects of the Pension Funds Act in as far as it relates to a complaint as defined in that act. But when you look at the, the, the company's tribunal, you find that most of the disputed areas, the, the tribunal does not necessarily have the jurisdiction to deal with those issues. So that means the parties are forced to approach, the, to approach the high court, which then brings into question as to how then can we, we, we deal with the issue of jurisdiction of this tribunal. And we need people to start reflecting on it, whether it is competent or even justifiable to increase the mandate or even the jurisdiction of the tribunal. And I think this is something that colleagues can, can, can chew on. But over and above that, when one looks at how the, the tribunal has been structured, it is structured as a, as a juristic person. And not only it, I mean, when, when you look at the consumer, National Consumer Tribunal as well, it is also uh, established as a juristic person. But when you look at things, uh, at a, at a quasi sort of judicial bodies, like the pension funds adjudicator, for instance, it is not uh, created as a, as a juristic person. Because if you are created as a juristic person, that means that you can be sued or you can sue in your own name. And this brings into for the question of if members of the, of the tribunal makes a decision and then that decision is reviewed, is that decision a judicial function or is it an administrative function? In other words, do you review the decision of the, of the member of the tribunal as an administrative action or do you review it um, as a decision that has been made by a lower structure that has to be looked into uh, by, by the high court? So now the question that comes to mind is, is the adjudicative function of the tribunal an administrative function or a quasi-judicial function? And I think this is something that one has to, to really zoom into and see um, how this really impacts the work of the tribunal. And the reason for, 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 for my concern in this respect is you find that there are matters where the, the tribunal is taken to, I mean, one, one party is not happy with a decision that has been made by the tribunal. 
and the tribunal is taken to, I'm not sure if it is a review or it is a, an appeal, because the act is not quite clear as to when somebody approaches the high court um, and takes the, the, the decision of the tribunal. Is that person taking the decision on appeal or is that person taking the decision on, on review? But th that's besides the point. Now, when the matter reaches the high court and the high court makes its decision, now the question is, should the adjudicate, should the, the tribunal join or be joined in those proceedings as a party? In other words, should the tribunal be a, an active participant in those proceedings? Or should the tribunal just abide by whatever outcome uh, that would, in other words, you have made a decision, then you are allowing the higher structure to reflect on your decision so that the higher structure can say whether you are wrong or you are right. Or should you go further and come to the frame and try to justify and argue your case? Now, the, the, the issue with this is you find that there are decisions that have been decided by the high court in South Africa where, like, the, the first one is Agility Holdings versus Company Tribunal. The second one is Highly Nutritious Food Company versus uh, Company Tribunal. Where you found that the, the high court will say the decision of the tribunal is wrong and then proceed to order costs against the tribunal. And that also is a question of concern. Should the high court, when it is reviewing, re, uh, reconsidering, or even uh, the matter has been appealed of the tribunal, should the high court order costs against the the tribunal. And I think these are broader questions that should that, that academics should actually reflect on and try to, to deal with it. Because one will look at the, the competition appeals court, for instance, does it order costs against the competition tribunal, even if it finds that the decision of the tribunal is wrong. Again, the labor court, does it order costs against the CCMA and the bargaining council if it does find that the, the award is it, it, wrong? Um, Again, the High Court has it order calls against the pension fund adjudicator if it finds the decision, the, 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 the determination of the adjudicator to be wrong. Now, it's interesting to note that recently, uh, on the 18th of September 2023, and um, the Supreme Court an interesting, interesting decision in Bennett and another versus National Consumer Tribunal. In this case, the merits of this case and the, the discussions are not necessarily important for uh, the point that I want to make. But nonetheless, this is where the National Consumer Tribunal uh, took active participation in the proceedings. And they, did, they opposed uh, the, the proceedings with a view to defend their own decision. And what the, the Supreme of Appeal was of the view that, look, it's fine that the the National Consumer Tribunal has been part, an active part of these proceedings. But having regard to how it is established and its functions, it may not be warranted to order court order against a statutory body. So obviously that particular order was in respect of the, the circumstances, circumstances of that particular case. But then it brings to the fore a broader issue. How should the high court deal with the decisions of the company's tribunal and whether it is justifiable for the high court when even if the tribunal decides to abide by the decision, is the high court justifiable to say we are going to order costs against the, 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 the company's tribunal? Is this ordering of costs on the basis that the tribunal is a juristic person and the tribunal is by and large seen as an administrative body. So now for academics, the question would be, what then should be the way forward in respect of how the role of the tribunal? Should the tribunal be an administrative body or should the tribunal be a quasi judicial organ or entity that is recognized as such? Or should it continue to be regarded as an administrative body. So those are the broader questions that I really want us to, 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 to reflect deeply on to see as to whether we can, we can find uh, some sort of workable solutions going forward. But in conclusion, 
the, the, the company tribunal plays an important role and it can, it can really assist to burden the workload of the high court. And I think we need to enter a space where we re-imagine the role of the tribunal. Obviously, what we will say, but uh, what about expertise? Because somebody can, can, can validly make a point and say, but look, let, let's look at the, the members of the, of the, of the, the current members of the, of the tribunal. And then we point me out and say, but look, you, you have Clement Marumuakai, for instance, who is by and large a pension law person, not necessarily a company law person. Is there a case to say the company tribunal should be constituted by people who are experts in, 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 in company law? I think that argument will be misplaced because then you need to lead it to its logical conclusion. That means each and every structure in South Africa, uh, then it should be presented over by people who absolutely know that area of law and will go as far, I mean, where are we going to stop? Even in the high court. We are going to have a case where we say, no, no, family matters have to be dealt with by people who are only competent in, in or who are expert in, in, in company law. I think that is an, a side argument. The argument here should be that, that the tribunal should be constituted by men and women who are competent and legally trained and are able to be able to carry the aspirations and the functions of that particular body forward. And if that is the case, then we don't focus more on, on the members, but we focus more on the, the entire institution and see how can we, 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 we reimagine this institution. One, to capacitate it, to make sure that members, once they become part of the tribunal, they are able to receive ongoing training to better serve the community um, which they are serving, which is the, those who have dispute in relation to the companies. But I think there's a, there's a case to be made that perhaps maybe uh, we need to, to, to look at, the, at, at, at how the companies have been operate um, it, 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 as compared to other similar tribunals in, in, in South Africa and how those tribunals work in their own fields. And I think if we reimagine that, there will be a case to be made to say, look, perhaps maybe the mandate of this particular body should be increased in order to make sure that some of the cases that are taking forever to be completed in the high court they can actually be expeditiously be disposed of. And we can have a functioning uh, tribunal that can better serve uh, South Africa. That's all that I had for you, colleagues. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, and I now hand over to uh, Lucinda Stiergan from CRPC. Thanks, Lucinda. We can see the slides. Sorry, everybody, just uh, this working with one screen. Let me just uh, share again. There we go. Is it visible now? It is. I can see it. Um, right. There we go. Sorry for the delay, everybody. Good evening once again. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to you uh, from CRPC side in terms of the relationship between the CRPC and the Companies Tribunal um, as dictated by, by the Companies Act. Let's jump right in. 
The CIPC is the registration and regulatory authority responsible for the implementation and the regulation of the Companies Act of 2008 and other legislation as stipulated in Schedule 4 of the Act. So if you go and look through the Companies Act, there's a Schedule 4 that lists a whole lot of other pieces of legislation that the CIPC as regulator is also responsible for. Uh, Section 1853 of the Companies Act describes the establishment of the Commission and confirms that each organ of state must assist the Commission in the maintaining of its independence and impartiality in order to perform its functions as a regulator effectively. Similarly, Lucinda, I can't yes. see the uh, slides changing, so I don't know if I'm the only one. Um, I'm still on CRPC okay. overview. No, no, if you can just change the slide. Okay, let's see. Do you see it moving or not? I think I might have to take it off of um, slideshow. It's not on slideshow. It, it, it is only, so maybe that's where the glitch Okay, let me see. Okay, let's see. There you yes. go. Yes. There, oh, is it moving? Okay, sorry there, about that. There you go. There you go. Thanks. We always test these things beforehand and then the gremlins creep <laughs> in afterwards. Uh, as I was saying, similarly, Section 193.2 of the Act places the exact same responsibility on all organs of state to assist the company's tribunal in the performance of its functions. The relationship between the CIPC and the company's tribunal is necessary in order for each organization to maintain its independence and perform its functions in line with the legislative requirements. So um, as an introduction, many discussions have unfolded the past 10 years or so that the Companies Act has been in operation around the functions of the com Companies and Intellectual Property Commission as the regulator and the areas within those functions that the company's tribunal can assist with in a meaningful way without having to refer a matter to court, uh, which was one of the purposes of the company's tribunal to be a first port of call, so to speak, for, for entities that need assistance without having to go to court. Section 195.1A to C of the Companies Act describes the function of the commission of the company's tribunal and indicates as follows. The company's tribunal or a member of the tribunal acting alone or in accordance with this act may adjudicate in relation to any application made to it in terms of this act, assist in the resolution of disputes and perform any other function assigned to it by or in terms of this act. Schedule 4 of the Companies Act, it's clear from the above that other pieces of legislation, as mentioned in Schedule 4 of the Act, would provide the Companies Tribunal with additional opportunities to adjudicate, assist with dispute resolution and more. One of these pieces of legislation that I want to highlight that is mentioned in uh, Schedule 4 uh, being enforced by the Commission is the Cooperatives Act, 6 of 2013. A co-op is one of the legal persons or juristic persons registered and maintained by the CIPC. It follows that where certain functions in terms of the Companies Act is assigned to the regulator, the CIPC, uh, decisions made, notices, compliance notices issued or orders made, and such functions fall within the jurisdiction of the company's tribunal to review related to companies. The same functions assigned to the CIPC in terms of the Cooperatives Act, as amended, can also be reviewed by the company's tribunal. So it is our contention that um, as the company's tribunal have a mandate to review the decisions made by the commission in certain areas, those same decisions made by the commis commission in terms of other pieces of legislation is also open for review by the company's tribunal. One of these areas is names. Uh, Section 161 of the Companies Act provides for any objection to a reserved or registered company name to be directed to the company tribunal for adjudication. Similarly, Section 10 of the Co-ops Act 
provides for a proposed name of a cooperative not to be confusingly similar to an exist, existing co-op, that it may be misleading or must not be prohibited or undesirable name. Section 11 of the Co-ops Act assigns to the Registrar of co Cooperatives, the CIPC, the responsibility of directing a co-op to change its name if it contravenes Section 10. As provided for in Section 161 of the Companies Act, Similarly, objections regarding the names of cooperatives as per sections 10 and 11 already mentioned can also be directed to the company's tribunal for adjudication. Annual general meetings that was mentioned by Prof. Clement, section 29 of the Cooperatives Act as amended provides that all co-ops must hold AGMs within a specific time period, and also indicate the decisions that need to be made during these AGMs, such as the appointment of an auditor. As is the case in terms of the Companies Act, the Companies Tribunal can play a vital role in providing for the extension of time in holding AGMs of co-ops upon application, of course, especially in the absence of any such mechanism within the Cooperatives Act. Another big one is the compliance notices. Section 84 of the Cooperatives Amendment Act provides for the register to order an investigation into or the inspection of the business of a cooperative. If the registrar, which is the CIPC, has reason to believe that the co-op has conducted its affairs in contravention of its cooperative principles, its constitution, or any provision of this act, the Cooperatives Act, or is satisfied that circumstances exist which justify such an investigation or inspection, which is very wide indeed. If the investigation or inspection performed by the registrar, the commissioner and the CIPC, the commission, warrants further action, such matters must be referred to the tribunal, the cooperative tribunal for resolution. Now, the cooperative tribunal in terms of chapter 12b, Provided uh, it was provided for the co-ops tribunal to be uh, established with functions that are set out in section 91N of the Co-ops Act as amended, which relates to the adjudication of applications by an aggrieved member or director, assist in the conflict or dispute resolution, assist the relevant agencies with the enforcement and compliance of the Act, assist in respect of requested dissolution, winding up or liquidation of a co-op, and assist the Registrar of Cooperatives in maintaining and updating the co-ops database register. You will note the areas that I've mentioned that the Cooperatives Tribunal should be responsible for are the very same matters that the company's tribunal is responsible for or mandated to uh, adjudicate upon in terms of the Companies Act. The Co-ops Tribunal, unfortunately, has not um, been uh, brought to life. The custodian and policy writers for the Cooperatives Amendment Act falls within the Department of Small Business Development, not the Department of Trade and Industry, while the CIPC is still the regulator. The president assented to the Amendment Act, and to date, unfortunately, no Cooperatives Tribunal has been established or formed. Discussions and conversations with the Department of Small Business Development on the subject of the Co-op Tribunal indicated possible amendments to the National Small Business Act, wherein the functions of the Co-op Tribunal may be absorbed, as well as the creation of a cooperative's ombud. Business rescue is another area primarily where the CIPC is responsible for overseeing and managing of the filing of relevant business rescue notices. Uh, for example, the special resolution to commence business rescue in terms of section 129 of the Act. Other functions of the Commission include the accreditation of professional bodies, licensing of individuals as business rescue practitioners, monitor the patterns of compliance, timeliest filing of applications to commence business rescue, suspensions, blinds, licenses, etc., and to raise awareness and educate the public and the courts on business rescue requirements. One of the problematic areas in terms of business rescue include the misalignment in the process of appointing a business rescue practitioner between the board and the court options. With the commencement of the business rescue, which is voluntary, the responsibility to appoint a business rescue practitioner lies with the company itself. The CIPC is not responsible for the appointment and 
and only endorses such appointment if the legislative requirements are met, such as a valid business rescue practitioner license. In various matters that have served before the company's tribunal and ultimately in court, the question regarding the authority for appointment of business rescue practitioners in the event of resignation, death or removal from office has been aired. Uh, in conclusion, in the State of the Nation address in 2022, the president highlighted the elimination of red tape, which unnecessarily hampers the ease of doing business of South Africans. From the preceding slides, it is clear that the company's tribunal is in a unique position to fulfill the tasks created in terms of the Companies Act, yes, but also possibly those tasks created in other legislations, only a few of which have been highlighted in the preceding slides. Development and growth in areas that will support and assist South Africans in expanding their businesses and eliminating costly and expensive court proceedings is a step in the right direction. Thank you all, short and sweet. Thank you very much, Cinda. Um, so is there any questions? Um, I'm looking at the chat, um, any questions? Um, I see Tsipong, one of my students. Um, can you maybe unmute, Busa? Thank you, Prof. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you to both speakers, um, Professor Clement and Miss um, Skip. Just, yes, <laughs> the name skipped me, sorry. Um, for Professor Clement, I have a question. And I would like to find out if, you know, how how do you see artificial intelligence having an impact on, you know, your duties and service delivery over the next few years? Or rather, let me just, you know, say technology as a whole. I mean, the tribunal performs mostly adjudicative um, duties. And I'll make an example with, you know, the Harcourt, there's something like case lines. Um, do you see something similar being implemented in this regard, you know, with reference to the tribunal? Because I'm also aware that um, applications are still filed physically and by email. Do you see something similar to, to that, like case lines happening in this regard? <clears throat> um, look, you know, I think AI is a, is a buzzword now, and I think it is on everyone's mind. Um, and I know that there the were, like, some of the richest men in the world had a meeting about how it should be regulated and all those kind of things. And of course, it, 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 it allows us to ask tough questions in respect to how we do law, how we provide legal services, and how legal services will be impacted by the advancement in technology, whether be it intelligent or the converse, right? So yeah. when, when one speaks about uh, AI, I may not be able to answer directly because we don't know where it is going because it is just in the air now and everything can happen at any time. But when one speaks about technological advancement, to the extent that there might be a difference, I'm not sure if I'm correct that there is, but assuming that I am, when one speaks about um, technological advancement in respect of service that we, we provide, um, it will depend on the budgetary sort of systems and, and, and policies in place as to how far the, the government is willing to go in ensuring that legal services um, are provided at a rate at which they should. Like, what is it you spoke about case line? Um, as I'm speaking to you now, uh, I'm in Mafikeng, um, and, and I'm, I'm having a case tomorrow. And in Mafikeng, we are still providing sort of uh, hard copies to court, right? So you find that even case line is restricted, it's regional. It's only uh, the the Haute division and the, uh, I mean, the Haute division, both Pretoria and Johannesburg. And the rest of the country, it is still de, uh, it is still analog, if you like, right? So it's a long way to go. And it's, it's an issue of will. It's an issue of polit uh, political will, but also the, the, the management of, 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 of the leadership of the courts to say, look, 
these are the resources that are available. We can actually try to assist. But in as far as the tribunal is concerned, um, obviously there, there will have to be talks within the the the, the particular ministry that 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 that, that offers the, the tribunal support and whether in its budgetary allocations it's willing to assist us in, in, in going electronic. Obviously it will assist. I mean, practicing in, in, in Houting, it's way much better than practicing anywhere else in, 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 in the country. And I think that is a problem because it speaks to access to justice. It speaks to efficiency um, because everyone else is running around with, with original. While in Houting, a copy is a copy. I mean, what you see is what you see. And a decision can be made thereof. So I think technological advancement can play a fundamental role in assisting the tribunal to do its work. But as to whether that will be soon, uh, I, I doubt. Because when one looks at how the budgets are allocated, I think the, the provision of legal services, it is really at the bottom. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. You are, Prof, um, and thank you very much um, for that. Um, yeah, it, we do have a long way to go. And I guess it's a matter of, you know, readily having resources to implement such. So thank you very much for your, your answer. It was very insightful. And I would like to extend the same question to Ms. Lucinda with respect to the CIPC. I mean, the CIPC website is quite, I don't know, easy to use because you can do everything there from, you know, name changes, director removals. Um, so I would like to find out from Ms. Lucinda what her views are on this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Tsipang. Um, yes, from, from our perspective, we have, and our commissioner as well, have a absolute vision of, of automation with the um, ease of doing business uh, at the back of our minds. And our minister, the minister of the DTIC, is, is very passionate also about the ease of doing business. And uh, we all know that walking around with that specific piece of paper, it's not make doing business making it easier. Uh, so slowly but surely, we are moving towards automated system systems. Um, as we go along, there are uh, more and more automated processes uh, being brought online. I think the biggest challenge from, from a CIPC perspective is the... Uh, Let's say I'm I'm not I'm I'm technologically challenged just by the way. So I think the biggest issue for CIPC would be the uh, space server space to host this whole lot of information. If you look at the uh, content of the company's um, MOIs alone, that vast majority of information that once you go the electronic way. Uh, where that information needs to be stored. That being said, however, there are already being um, explorations into cloud-based uh, processes and storing information in the cloud. And then as, as you are uh, a legal students and legal practitioners in the legal fraternity, you also know that we have to take the, the um, confidentiality issues of uh, personal information and restricted information and all of that into account. So there's definitely a distinctive move towards uh, automated processes and uh, doing everything on the web and in the cloud, uh, but it needs to be, as Prof. Clement also indicated, it needs to be well thought through uh, to ensure that there is no contravention of any other aspects like, like Poppy, for example, that uh, is left at the wayside with the forward moving momentum. Thank you for your question. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Lucinda. Thanks. Thanks, Tifang. Um, I enjoy your questions always. Um, then, um, Mr. Kosa from um, ETI, I see you um, mentioned in your comments that um, there is an online case management system that is now online uh, for the company's tribunal. Thank you for that. Appreciate uh, that update. Um, and then um, I just want to mention, um, Mr. Koza, do you want, oh, there goes the hand. Um, I, I just want to mention that, uh, Prof. Clement, that if you need any lobbyist, um, the 2023 LM companies 
um, law and uh, insolvency law groups will definitely join you um, to, to ask to request budget for technology, especially after they've submitted their um, assignments this year. So um, on that note, I really want to thank all the students, all my colleagues, um, everybody that has taken time to join us this evening, and especially our speakers for sharing your experience and for taking time to, to actually give this presentation. And I look forward to seeing all of you next time. Um, thank you very much, and please have a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming through. The University of Johannesburg, the future reimagined.